speakers tonight. Mark Peterson is going to focus on charts, technicals, price targets. Um, <coughs> glad to have him here. Joe Youngbauer back again, and, and we're certainly happy to have him come from the cities. With high ground trading, he's going to do some of the macro markets, supply and demand picture. And then finally, Brian Bird is, uh, is here from St. Louis with John Stewart and Associates. Uh, he's a partner at that firm, and they're going to be putting the the managed grain program together. So with that, I'll uh, give it to Joe here, and thanks again for coming. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joe Youngbauer. You probably know that. I've been here a number of times. Always have to start out with a joke. So a woman walks into a pharmacy, and she strolls right back, right to the pharmacist. And she's nicely dressed. She doesn't look like she's agitated or anything, but, but she goes right beeline to the pharmacist, and she says, I'd like to buy some cyanide. And the pharmacist said, cyanide? What do you need cyanide for? Well, I want to kill my husband. <laughs> and he says, lady, if I sold you cyanide, you killed your husband, I'd lose my business, I'd go to jail. You're certainly going to jail. There's no way I can sell you any cyanide. And she said, oh, just a minute. And she opens up her purse and she takes out a photograph. And on the photograph, is the, the uh, pharmacist's wife in bed with this woman's husband. <laughs> and the pharmacist looks at the photograph, oh my goodness, oh my, well, this changes everything. Why didn't you tell me you had a prescription? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's always good, especially the last few years, it's, it's important to have some humor. I think last year I had to tell three jokes because the negative vibe that I put out, because I'm gonna tell you what, what I really think is happening. It wasn't a lot of fun. This year I got, there's a little more balance here. Uh, that's a good thing. I've been doing this 38 years. Uh, I don't believe anybody in this room is my client, and so I, it's free for me and easy for me to tell you what I truly think. And I think the co-op does a good job in, in that regard, having somebody that's not real involved here. First thing I have to talk about is a legal disclaimer. <laughs> Essentially has a couple of important points. Everybody has to do this. I know you know this, but you can lose money trading futures. And I'm <laughs> I also heard, but I don't know if it's true, you can lose money farming, but <laughs> that's not on the slide. Another thing here is past performance is not necessarily indicative of future uh, performance. So. Um, or future results, but uh, so no matter how good I've been in the past, doesn't mean I can grab my backside with both hands and two tries tonight. <laughs> Where do we go from here? You know, it's it's a more important question tonight to ask than it might have been, especially when we were much much higher, because now it, it makes the difference between some guys' profitability, some guys' losses. And even at some point, it could be the some guys not farming anymore if, if things don't improve at some point. The best way for me to know where we're headed is to look at where we're at and where we've come from. First slide here is a, a weekly <laughs> US dollar slide. You can see where we were a year ago. It says last January, we were right at 900 the week of these seminars last year. We, we raced up. And we had been coming up very, very dramatically from in the 70s, and we got up to 103. We stalled out, chopped sideways, and tried it again at the end of the year. Did that, we got a new high, but we had a reversal week, and I think today we're in 95, 70, or something like that. Uh, I've, I've been out on the road speaking, so I, I'm not exactly sure, but it's about there. What I would consider to be good news is the fact that I don't think you're going to see that the type of response that we had from uh, 2014 up to the high in 2015. I don't think we have to suffer through another one of those. Uh, and there's a number of reasons that I feel that way. That doesn't mean, woohoo, prices are going skyrocketing, but it's a good thing to stop the dollar's monumental type of move. Doesn't mean it can't go up, but I think you're going to see it two-sided this coming year. This is the other chart that, that I always talk about. I always talk about crude oil. 
I don't know if you remember this, but last year I talked about relationships, positive correlations between markets, and the two markets that are most positively correlated are, of course, corn and crude oil. Uh, last year I started out with pictures of Brad and Angelina and Bill and Hillary, and I said, you know, some relationships move well together, and others kind of move a different way together. So, um, but, but one of the things that, that you can see clearly over time is if, if you look at this chart, you kind of have an idea what's happened to corn over the last few years. We, we came down today to the very lows again. Um, what I don't have on here, in 2009, the low in crude oil was, I believe, 33.20 in the nearby. Uh, we came into the, we got below $34 for a bit today before closing above it. Um, you know, the world's a nasty place. You got, you got uh, some guy named Jong or whatever in, in South Korea or in North Korea blowing off nuclear weapons. You've got the Saudis and the, and the uh, Iranians fighting. You know, the Shiite, the Sunni. I know all of you guys would feel terrible if they started killing one another. It'd be a horse for it. Um, but, but nonetheless, there's a lot of scary stuff that could, that could exacerbate this and make it go lower still. But at the same time, when you're starting at $33 and change, it's very difficult for the crude oil market to have a $40 down this year, isn't it? So, yeah. Will it go, will, will we see a low this year? I think there's a, a fair chance that this is the year that crude puts in a low. I think things can change enough that that, that happens. So again, it's not a jump up and down you who, but it's a positive to see that happening. It, it would not be any fun to see crude go down to $10 or something. Really, when you think about it, what cut the price of, of crude oil by two-thirds, they're the same factors that cut the price of corn by that amount. And what that really is, is overproduction. We have, in, if you're in an industrial metal like copper, they call it overcapacity. We're producing too much, not just here, but around the world. We're producing way too much of all kinds of base commodities. And, you know, there's sayings like, low prices cure low prices. Yeah. Why does that happen? Why does that work? We're going to look at a couple of ideas about that tonight. You know, one of the things that happens is, in, and not just in oil, but also for, for farmers, is bankers can decide, balance sheets don't, don't make sense. We're not going to continue to, to uh, fund your operating loan, and it's... That's one way that overproduction happens. I have a friend in the oil business in Texas and he's telling me his business is off 75 to 80% each and every month. He sells stuff to the, to the oil fields. Yeah, it, it's making a difference, I'm sure. And, and eventually that catches up, but that's a long-term solution to low prices in grain. World economies are showing huge disparities. Our economy is growing. We're seeing GDP go up. We're seeing jobless rates going down. Those are good things. You know, the way you inspire demand is to have economies clicking along, like when China in 07, 08, 09 was growing 14, 12% every year, just pumping it out, demanding more and more commodities. But right now, Europe is still doing quantitative easing. They're still out there pumping in billions of euros into their system on a monthly basis, trying to get that prime, pump that, uh, market and that economy to get it going again. I think that it's going to work. It's worked here. I think it will work there. I think that their economy will show better growth by the year end. China's a real big worry. We, we got the, the market got spanked real hard on Monday. And the reason it got spanked, one of the major reasons, was because of the 10th month in a row, Chinese man, manufacturing data came out in a negative sense, and it was worse than they had hoped for, and it was down. That's not a good thing. China has a lot of reserves. They're, they're not real used to, to figuring this kind of stuff out, but I think they will figure it out, and they'll get back to where they're growing again. I'm just not sure when. Certainly they're not doing it right now. And another problem that we have is emerging markets. Markets like 
countries like Brazil and Argentina, uh, they've got some rampant inflation, they've got some major problems going on there. And one of the reasons that affects all of us in the room is every time their, their currency goes down, essentially anybody in the world, that, an end user that wants to buy corn or beans or whatever from them, gets to buy it cheaper. And our dollar is going up and theirs is going down. It's, it's real easy to see why exports, that might be a thing on this coming report, US exports could be dropped, and dropped enough that it makes a difference in price. But the other side of an emerging market of, of, of their currency going down, and I'll, I'll show you a slide of, of the Brazilian real. It was 65 cents to buy a real in 2011, it's 25 cents today. That's a huge move in their currency, isn't it? And it gives their farmers a great advantage, doesn't it? But what this doesn't, what you might not talk about or hear, is what does it do to the people in, internally in the country? It's tremendously inflationary to them. Inflation rates there, it's, it's similar to saying a loaf of bread costing a dollar in 2011 would cost $4 right now. There's a reason why the president of Brazil is under impeachment right now. They want to kick her out. The people are extremely dissatisfied. We just saw a major election go to the opposite party in Argentina, where the guy is changing all kinds of things, trying to get in this inflation in line and try and stimulate their economy in a different way. Again, we're not going to drop. 40 cents on, on the Brazilian real this year because it's down to 25. Can it go lower? Yes, it can go lower. Can that have a negative impact on us? You bet it can. Do we need to continue to be vigilant in our marketing and, and taking care of business? Yeah, we do. But nonetheless, we can tell that we're much closer to lows now than we were a year ago in a number of these things. And while it's not time to pop the champagne court and celebrate, at least the news a year ago, I, I, I was a lot gloomier than I am now, because there was no hope at that point, in my mind, for prices improving in the next year, and, it, and they really didn't. While many prices may drop further, it's, it's selective which ones will, but most of them have a chance of making new lows. I think the majority of the, the giant moves have been made and are done. I got the mailman up there saying with a letter, is it good news? I don't know, is that good news? At the same time, I don't believe that we'll return to the cyclical major bull market in all, in all commodities that we were in in 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, I'm a, an economics major 100 years ago when I was in college. Uh, they call it the dismal science. I don't know why. It's fun. But anyhow, uh, basic economic theory will tell you that, that there's supply and demand. And those were demand-driven markets, those years. They were very, very explosive. Those are the types of rallies that really last a long time and are wonderful, and we all can take advantage of them. This is a Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. I apologize for the black, back, uh, black background. It's, it's way too dark on this screen. Uh, in 2014, we were trading about 600, 640. This is a basket of a lot of major commodities, basically. And what it's showing is that, again, we have come down, dropped precipitously. We're down to 300 on it. It's nasty and it's ugly, but again, I think what we have done is we have taken the majority of the fluff out of the markets. While it still can go lower, I'll be surprised if we don't, somewhere in here, start to identify a bottom in the next. I, at one point, I thought it would be the first quarter. It, it's sometime in 2016, I think you, you look at this and you say, hey, there's a glimmer of hope in some of this stuff. So in 2016, I'm looking for bottoms in energy prices to occur. I think more world economies will show positive growth. I think that'll come out of the uh, European, uh, the EU. I think they're, they're closer uh, than some folks realize. That's demand, okay? Economies that are growing is demand. We need 
demand all around the world to start improving. More improving economies is a good thing for everybody in the room. I think there'll be less overproduction. I think it'll be forced upon some folks, but I think eventually we'll have less overproduction. I put early signs of inflation. There's some stuff that I read that would suggest five years from now, we might all be talking about what are we gonna do about inflation? Right now it's not a problem, not a problem at all. We finally stopped destroying capital, and now we're slowly starting things to improve. But uh, when you borrow the amounts of money, create the amounts of money out of thin air that, that we have done, it, it'll be a very hard game for the Fed to control this and control it effectively. It's, it's real easy to put us back in recession or all of a sudden have inflation, and uh, we'll see how they do. So while we're not out of the woods yet, I think prices should find bottoms in most major commodities in the next two years. I think some of them will happen this year, and then I think things will slowly get better. <coughs> Saw a great movie over the, the holidays called The Big Short. It's, it's about the housing market bubble. I've talked about it at, at meetings in the past. If you wanna have somebody explain in really simple manner my wife understood it after watching this film. It's an entertaining film. Brad Pitt's in it for the women. I mean, it's you know, it's entertaining. But uh, go see it if you get a chance. Watch it on Netflix on a cold winter night in a few weeks. Talk real briefly about grain fundamentals. What's wrong with grain prices? I mean, you know. Well, we just we just basically said what's wrong with it. for a third year in a row, both domestically and internationally, we produce more than we consume. The dollar has been up, and that, that's a big problem. There's this overcapacity in the markets. So how are we going to get rid of that? What can change where grain prices are at? Basic economic supply would, or theory would say, you either reduce the supply or you increase the demand. And it takes a long time to get that demand to really get going and really push it. Things that reduce supply, droughts, floods, frosts, you know, the things that take yield away, that destroy some of the product. Another way would be for less acres to get planted due to banks being unwilling to lend producers money. Nope, I'm not gonna let you plant corn this year, it's too expensive, the inputs. You know, the, the more under, 370, 365, the new crop is trading, the tighter the bankers are gonna get, and, and they're gonna say to the guys that they look at their cash flows and they're paying too much for land rent, they're gonna say, sorry, I don't want you planting corn this year. So, the other side, increasing demand, again, if we had the dollar back off a bunch, and I'm not seeing that happening this year, but if it did, that would be a thing that could help our demand. Uh, if a bunch of world economies start growing faster, that's going to help demand. And, I, and a, the last one is a really slow thing, but it's a constant thing. World population keeps going up. Five years from now, we need to produce more than we produce today. Five years after that, it's still going to be a greater number that we're going to have to produce. But that's not going to help prices next week or next month. So the best chance that we have, in my estimation, for a price rally comes from either a steep fall in the dollar, and I don't think the odds of that are very great, or from a significant weather market. I've got a picture here of the Palmer Drought Index from August of 2012. You know, wow, what a difference a couple of years made. Um, but since Joe Doherty asked me if, if I couldn't say something bullish tonight, I decided I'd include it the next couple of slides. Actually, it's been three years. I have not had one bullish slide. I've been doing this 38 years. I've given lots of talks. I'll tell you what, it's, it gets old when you look up in the audience and it looks like you kick their dog and punch their wife and everybody is, you know? I, I had to tell three jokes last year just because it looked like you'd come up and lynch me. So, I, I got something that, that I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna show you something that's Polish, that's positive. This is a chart of the Great Lakes annual maximum ice coverage. 
you look at all the Great Lakes and the surface area of the lakes, what percentage of them are covered in ice? Back in uh, 1979, almost 95% of the lakes were covered in ice. In 1994, 90.7%. In 2014, just a couple years ago, 92.5% of the Great Lakes surface area was covered in ice. Each of those years, we had record, record yields. <clears throat> Anybody have a good yield in 2014? Remember that? that? It was a good year. Conversely, though, if we look at the downside, at the lower end, 1983, 18% of the Great Lakes were covered with ice at, at its maximum. In uh, 2002, it was 9.5. In 2012, that chart that I just showed you, that Palmer chart, uh, drought index chart, that was 2012, we had 12.9% of the Great Lakes covered with ice. Each of those years, we had over a 10% reduction in, in yield. You know, this is the ice cream. Ice, ice, baby. Hey, will it work? Does it have a chance? There is some statistical uh, validity to what I'm showing you here. It's kind of exciting uh, to think that maybe there, there's a chance. But before I go any further, please don't misunderstand me. I am not wildly bullish on anything. I'm still very concerned about markets, but this is a supply side rally. This isn't demand that's gonna keep coming for months and months and months, but there's gonna be a chance, possibly this summer, for a, a big enough scare to run prices up. And of course, what are we gonna do when that happens? We're gonna say, this is only a supply side thing. We don't have all kinds of new demand that's gonna keep happening. We're gonna take advantage of it, and we're gonna sell some of our cash, aren't we? We're gonna get floors at higher levels, maybe into the 17 crop. We're gonna get excited about that. Because wouldn't it be fun to operate at a, at a profit, a nice profit this coming year? I think it would be. So for this to work, every single one of you in the, in the room here if you have that internet thing, you can go on the internet and you can type in Great Lakes Ice uh, Depth or whatever. They'll show you each lake. They'll show you last year. They'll show you a couple of years. But I, you know, all the statistics are there for anybody to see. So middle of March, it starts going away. If it's if the maximum ice figure never got to 20% or greater, go out and do, do what are called courage calls. You don't do them right away in March, but sometime as you come down, if planting goes well, like in 83, we had a, how many guys farming in 83? I was a relatively young broker, and I was stupid and stubborn, and I identified something was going on and got along a bunch of grain, and the market started going up, and boy, I hurt my back, I was patting myself so hard, and then I forgot I didn't sell it, because I, I thought, oh, it's just gonna keep going. But it was a supply side rally. There was too much everywhere else in the world and it didn't matter and the price fell back down. Missed a good opportunity. But I learned that I missed that. And you have to make sure you know what kind of rally are we involved in, a supply or a demand side. I, what this is, again, is a supply side type of rally. So now I'm gonna do something I haven't done in a long time, I'm gonna show a second positive, well, at least a neutral slide. It's not bearish, by God. Going back 56 years in Chicago Board of Trade prices, if you look at the first of every year, and then at the 31st of December, in 26 of those years, prices went lower in that year time frame. Furthermore, 10 additional years, the price went lower a second year in a row from January 1st to December 31st. And only in three years did prices go lower for a third year in a row from January 1st to December 31st. 2015 was the third year. We've never closed lower four years in a row. It's a statistic. Can it be broken? Yeah, we could break it. 
It's, it's not unlike the Minnesota Vikings could beat the, the Packers. Right, Jeff? I mean, we could win a Central Division. <laughs> right, Jeff? <laughs> People aren't expecting it to happen. But <laughs> I'm trying to go fast tonight because after the seminar, Jeff's going to come up and explain the, the theory that he has of how this was a big uh, government conspiracy to get the... the, the more season tickets sold at the new stadium. But I'll, I'll wait and let you explain that, Jeff. Anyhow, we've never closed four years more in a row. Enough said. Uh, I was kind of I was kind of disturbed earlier when when uh, Pete told me that a guy had called and said that he had seen our presentation yesterday, and the guy said, "Oh yeah, they were Polish." No, we're not. We're not Polish. This is an opportunity for you guys to realize here's a marketing opportunity that you will sorely, sorely be un very unhappy if it happens. It goes up and it spikes and it comes back down. That's what supply side rallies do. Watch for it. If it happens, take advantage of it. When's the hardest time to sell grain? At the top of a, a grain market, right? It looks like it's going to the moon, so be ready for it if it happens. <laughs> Again, 2013, we closed at 694. We started the year at 694. 2014 at 427. 414 and three quarters last year. We were 358 and three quarters on the first day of training this year is where we were starting from. So, if this theory is correct, this again is not a pop the champagne pain cork because all it would mean is that we would be above 358 and three quarters as a minimum next year, and I'm not excited about that. But the ice train, if, if that thing happens, and, and you guys don't market it, I don't know, I, you gotta pound it somehow into your heads. Do this, write it down, look for it, and take advantage of it. Don't be afraid to market if we get a spike up in prices. In 83, we, we made a low in the middle of June. It popped up about 20 cents, which was big money back then. Came back in double bottom and took off the 1st of July. It's like they shut off the a switch, hit a light switch, turned off the rain, and it didn't rain. And by the middle of August, it looked like a nuclear bomb had been dropped in Iowa. It, I mean, it, it destroyed that crop. That was a massive reduction in yield that year. Why we can't get complacent and say, oh, the ice cream's gonna save me, is because if you go, I, I have, in 38 years, I got relationships with a lot of bankers, with analysts and people. I had, I had asked three of them in anticipation of coming out and doing seminars to send me cash flow ideas, what cash flows look like for guys. And depending upon where they're at, they use higher or lower uh, yields and things, but. Essentially using two and a quarter to 250 cash rent, $150 fertilizer cost, selling the corn at 365. Can we sell corn right now at 365? Nowhere near in the new crop. But but it would result in small profits from one of them and $85 to $100 an acre losses for others. That's not good news. That's not bullishness, guys. It um, but. That's why it's so important when we have opportunities to market, if we get them, we need to do so. So some bankers may dictate what crop and how many acres their clients can plant in 2016. If we produce a real large crop again this year, more bankers will, will be able to come and decide a much more significant amount of, of who's planting what or if they're getting to plant. In 2017, don't let it be. You guys become one of them. How could you add a hundred dollars of income per per acre? That's 48 inch font. On, you know, on the computer, when you go to 48, it's real hard to fit it on the page. It says caution. It's it's supposed to be dark red letters. This involves risk. If you don't understand it. Do not do this. Mark Peterson, an employee here, understands this. He gives classes on things like this. If you go to one of his uh, option seminars, you can understand what I'm talking about. But essentially, this past October, 
I sold 370 March 370 puts and March 370 <coughs> calls. How many puts and calls expire <coughs> making money? What percentage of them make money? 10%. Yeah, well, it, you know, depending upon the thing and the time, it's, it's, it's something like 80 to 90% of all options purchased expire worthless. So the person who collects it, the money, has some, some income that can come from it. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. But back in the early 2000s, when markets were chopping in small ranges, that used to be where huge amounts of income came for us. We would be strangling the market, selling puts and calls all the time. And it, and it worked really well. Because the time value would erode and you're essentially collecting that time value. Anyhow, we sold these 370 puts and calls. We collected 60 cents. They were worth 24 cents the day I made the slide. That would mean that we're up 36 cents of profit. Uh, if you were producing 200 bushel an acre and you multiply this out and, and did this with enough uh, contracts that it hit all your production, that should read $72 of profit so far. Again, it's only for a very sophisticated investor. Now, before I'm allowed to show a slide, I, my whole presentation, I have to send it to a compliance officer at the firm that I cleared through. He called me up and said, Joe, you can't use that slide. And I said, why not? And he said, it's not representative of your client base of what you do. And I said, what do you mean it's not representative? He said, well, you know, give me the names of some of the clients and their account numbers, let me check and see. And he, he came to find out when he went and looked, that we had strangled last July's market, we had done it again in September, we had done it again in December, we had done it again in March, I have some on in May, and I have some on in July. Every one of the ones that we've taken off so far, we, we've made nice profits on. Doesn't mean that we will on these. You start getting one of those spikes, you gotta have a broker, and you have to have the knowledge that you need to move and take action, defensive action. But Guys, I want you to think outside the box in a year where it's challenging to make money. Look at other opportunities, other ways of making money. One of the things that's neat about UFC is they, they provide you with an in-house guy like Pete who has tremendous knowledge about all kinds of stuff to help you do that. They bring in an outside firm, a guy that has a proven track record of marketing grain. Take advantage of these things this year, guys. It's, I think it's really, really important to do so. On a chart, what it looks like is if, if you collect 60 cents of selling 370 puts and calls, that would mean the market has to be above 430 at expiration to lose money or below 310 at March expiration here at the end of February to lose money if it's going down. The practical matter is Generally speaking, I look for 75 to 80% of, of the money that I, col I could collect. And anytime it starts getting, the market starts making me nervous after that, I just take off the trade and I go out and look for another month and do it again. But this has been a tremendously successful method of trading for my clients. They have made significant profits from this uh, for the last nine months or so. Just an idea, guys, just trying to Stimulate some thought processes here, ways of, of showing profitability in 2016. Because if you look at supply and demand figures, if you look at the acres, the supply, the usage, the stocks, find something they're exciting. Find a 15% or a 10% move on something. Now, we have burdensome stocks. The, the numbers 16, 17 came from the USDA Outlook Conference. The other numbers are USDA numbers. They will change, things do change. On occasion we get jolts and shocks and sometimes they're negative and sometimes they're positive. <clears throat> I've learned long ago, you're not gonna out guess what USDA is gonna do. So, so be res respond to it or, or know what you're doing in either event beforehand. But these are burdensome stock levels. It's not going to generate a long-term <coughs> run up in prices. Even if the ice trade hits, and it's not just the scare that spikes it up, but we actually take away 300, 400 million bushels of production, the world still has a lot of corn. So, 
The same is true in soybeans. We, we, the acreage number, USDA at their Outlook Conference said we're gonna plant less acres of beans. I disagree, I think we're gonna plant more acres of beans and we'll reduce corn acres and it'll be an economic decision that forces that to happen. Nevertheless, looking at a, a, a little bit smaller crop because of reduced acres, the supply is still there, the usage is not that big. Again, these numbers aren't moving very much and it ends up with a stocks figure you know, in 1415, we only had 191 million uh, metric tons of, uh, or uh, million bushels of excess stocks of, of uh, soybeans. Uh, the year before that, it was right down at 100 million. This year, 465 million. Those are big numbers. And what, what is really concerning, I, there's a lot of guys I follow in the business, I listen to analysts that I, I have great respect for. They're not always right, no one is. But these guys, when they say things, it, it gets my attention. And a number of them have said they believe we could see in excess of 600 million bushel carryout in soybeans this year if we shift a few acres and if we have a good crop. I would tell you, it would virtually be impossible to still have an eight in front of the soybean number if you have a 600 million plus carry out. So is it imperative that we find ways of getting floors underneath this market, of taking care of marketing business? Yeah, it is. Did I at least give you a little glimmer of hope tonight, Joe? Yeah, thank you. Because we needed to do that. We all deserve that. We, we, should, we should have, uh, the chance and the opportunity to make some money. And I think we have that chance a couple of different ways, a couple of different things that I've shown you tonight. What should you be doing? Get floors under things. Am I telling you to get floors under markets while we're making new lows? No, no, I'm not. But there are, there are ways, and Pete's gonna discuss some of them, about going about getting some things done, about having targets in the marketplace. Targets, uh, at the elevator here, wherever, if you, if you never put a target in, if you don't have a goal, how are you gonna achieve it? How are you gonna get started? Do some things for your business, positive things, get started on that. You know, using vertical foot spreads. Uh, again, the other thing I would say is add to protection on any pre-planting rally. If the, if the seed's still in the seed bag and the price is going up, it's not because we're killing the crop, right? It's funds are moving, or it's a, a variety of different factors, but if they get it up to a point where you're profitable, for goodness sakes, make certain you get more floors underneath and things that are gonna protect you. The last thing I say is watch the Great Lakes ice measurement. If it's under 20%, go out and buy some courage calls. The worst thing in the world is to have a market spike up and not take advantage of it. But if you go out and you spend inexpensive amount of money on separate these call options and the market does take off it's one heck of a lot easier to come out and sell some cash because you can say well you know I got those calls I, if, if it keeps going up I, I still benefit but if the thing falls apart hey at least I sold some cash on the up there right so that's just an idea of one way of, of taking advantage of that any questions if you want to contact me, that's my uh, toll-free 800. It's 888-409-2511. Otherwise, I'm going to introduce a, a man who's a legend in his own mind. He zings me too often, so I needed to say something. Uh, but uh, Pete, Pete really does know a lot about this stuff. He, he'll give you a great presentation, and I appreciate your time and your interest in it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.